Hello, and welcome to our video audio podcast, Couched in Color. I'm your mental health expert, teen and young adult crusader, and psychological scientist, Dr. Alfie. This podcast reflects my life's work, helping our young people and young at heart identify mental health challenges, disrupt negative patterns, and discover the best versions of themselves. I'm so happy that you've joined us. For over 20 years, I want you to know that I've had my finger on the pulse of BIPOC teen mental health. I recognize that historically and currently with these dual pandemics of COVID and racial injustice raging, our young people are suffering, sometimes they're struggling, and always the care that they need is quite scarce. So each week I'm joined by young people, mental health experts, celebrities, and influencers to help us uncover the secrets to healing the hearts and minds of our BIPOC teens, their families, in their communities. Here at Couched in Color, we believe deeply in spreading love and light bolstered by culturally relevant science. So let's dive in. Hi, everyone. It is my, like, y'all know I don't get nervous. So I'm gonna tell y'all right now, like, mama is nervous. I'm like, ah! So I just love this Black girl magic that we have going on today. And I am just completely over the moon to have this guest on. She is an author. She has this phenomenal new book I want to, we're going to talk about, and I just would like for her to introduce herself. My guest today is the amazing, I'm just going to name it, the amazing Christina Hammonds-Reed. Thank you so much for joining me. It is a pleasure. So would you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Thank you so much for having me. So I am Christina author of The Black Kids. Uh, it's my first novel, so it's been kind of a crazy year for me, debuting in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of this huge moment of racial reckoning we're having. But it's been um, kind of a wonderful thing too, because it has me coming together with everyone like you and people where I'm able to discuss things that are important to me in meaningful ways. So I am very happy to be here. Yay, thank you so much. So before we even get into it, for the people who've been kind of under a rock, haha, and don't know about your book, um, can you just tell us a little bit about, you said the title of the book is The Black Kids. Tell us a little bit, uh, you know, whatever you'd like about your book. Sure. So The Black Kids is a coming of age story that focuses on Ashley Bennett, who is a privileged black teenager growing up in Los Angeles uh, on the eve of the 1992 uprising in response to the acquittal of the officers involved in the Rodney King uh, beatings. And we follow her over the course of the book uh, as she sort of starts to realize who she wants to be, who she doesn't want to be, um, coming to terms with things like toxic friendships, her family and their kind of intergenerational trauma that hasn't really gone examined by her. Her older sister, Jo, gets kind of swept into the riots as a result of her own self-destructive behavior. Um, so the book's really, it, it's, it's about a moment of racial reckoning in Los Angeles, but it's also a reckoning for Ashley. It's also her coming into herself as a person. Um, and just really, I think it's the city and Ashley are on parallel journeys throughout the book where they're both kind of grappling with these really huge issues and and how do we come out the other end of this so tell me what made you decide I mean this is so much and you know as I think about it what I'm thinking about is how much I resonate with the main character and her experiences now like I tell everybody I'm Gen X I'm much older but but there's so much that's timely and timeless about the story about this young girl and I have I have to call this out and I am just so curious about what made you decide to write about a privileged black girl because so often I'm telling you so often when we read or see or hear anything and I think I remember reading a little bit about this when I was reading about you and you know all the publicity surrounding your book nobody talks about these kids and it's, it's almost as if Black privileged kids are like unicorns, like they don't exist. Do you know what I mean? So just talk a little bit about what made you decide to, to pick this type of young Black girl to talk about. Well, I think it's, I mean, a lot of it's born out of my own experience. I grew up relatively privileged, um, not quite as privileged as Ashley, but with some degree of privilege. I went to private schools. I did ice skating. I did horseback riding. Like I did all these things that we normally associate with 
uh, white people of some degree degree of means means and I was used to always being uh, one of the few black space or black faces in a classroom or in a church or in whatever setting I was in um, and like you said, there's not much representation of what that looks like. What are the struggles of being one of the only ones? And also, I think sometimes our society ignores the fact that there have always been privileged Black people, right? Like, we have we have always had people who were, like, part of Jack and Jill or who were free in the time of slavery and building their own wealth. Um, and we've always had these communities of color who maybe we're not as uh, disenfranchised as mm -hmm. other communities, or at least economically had just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So to, to me, it's always interesting to see how do class and race intersect? Because a lot of times we really don't look at that. A lot of portrayals of blackness are um, very much rooted in the inner city struggle or uh, the urban struggle, um, Southern struggle. And, and I just really wanted to see what does that look like from a different angle? Something that I identified more with. Um, and also Ashley's not at the heart of the riots. Like that was important to me. A lot of times when books are, I guess, social justice books, they frame the individual as being like at the heart of the matter. But for a lot of us, that's not actually the case. Like for a lot of us, something happens and, and we feel it, we respond mm -hmm. to it very viscerally, but it hasn't happened to us. And, and we still have to navigate our own um, how we feel, what, what do our communities feel around us? How do we respond to that? How do we keep going in our lives? Mm -hmm. Even when there's these huge things happening all around us that we're responding to as black people. So for me, that's a lot of where it came from was just wanting to use a different lens to focus on things and a lens that I could have used when I was growing up. A story like this is something I would have loved when I was Ashley's age and just kind of seeing someone closer to me on the page <sighs> everything about that is just so beautiful and it's so honest because it really reflects my experience as you said your experience if i think about generations sort of i had that experience as gen x you had that experience as millennial my daughter is having that experience now right as gen z and the just this thread right the thread of you don't have to be right in the middle of it as a black person to be impacted by it right, right. or you don't have to be the person who necessarily i talk about this all the time even now just because you're not out in the streets with a sign right protesting it does not mean that one you're not passionate about it and it does not mean two that you're not impacted by it. you just may have a different way of managing and engaging and so for me I, you know, I think about the young people and I think about Ashley in the book and her friend circle. And the thing that's, that sticks out to me in the friend circle is sort of this, being in this almost like a no man's land where like I think about how often she says there are times when she really wants to go in on these girls, but she's like, yeah, I don't want to be that girl today. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm just like, oh my God, so many times, even as an adult, I'm like, is this the battle I want to pick today or am I just going to chill out and sort of thinking about, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on what a girl like Ashley or you or my daughter, or, and you know, in some respects, even me, what does that might that do to us internally and emotionally to always be like trying to decide is today the day I bite my tongue or is today the day I let them have it and say, you know, you can't say that. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think that's kind of the low level stress of being a black person in America on a regular basis that's then compounded by when you're one of the only ones, you have the burden of representation for your entire race, right? Like when you are the only person in a setting of privilege or in an office or in some capacity, you feel always like you're holding back and you're holding in. And that wears on you, right? Like that that can really impact how you view yourself. It impacts your friendships if you're not having really honest friendships because you're always holding some piece of yourself back. Yeah. Um, it 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 I, I think that like that's kind of where Joe comes into play, where Joe's like gone beyond where Ashley is in the book, where she's just like, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, but for me it was a struggle to get there too, because I think for so long 
especially as maybe middle class, upper middle class black people, we're taught that you have to present a certain way in order to be accepted, in order to be in the best schools or to get the best whatever, you have to speak a certain way. And, and that's just what's been passed down over generations because those were the mechanisms that like our elders had to get through and to get by. But all of that is so wearing, right? Like all of that really takes a toll on your mental health and really kind of, um, it can make you feel like you're not allowed to be a whole person sometimes mm. when, when that burden is on you to represent in that way. Ooh, yeah, you are preaching a whole word, right? <laughs> I mean, it really, it is so burdensome. And I just, again, I'm back to this idea of we don't have enough opportunities to talk about what it's like for kids across the socioeconomic spectrum, just because kids have stuff, just mm-hmm. because like I, all my friends were in Jack and Jill when I was a kid, right? So the, I remember all of that. And my mom was sort of, she's deceased, but she was like, you know, that's not her thing. She said, she didn't poo poo it for other people. You know, she let us go to the dances and you know, all our, like I said, all our friends, we did the ski trips, you know how it is, you do all that stuff. Huh. But you know, it was just this idea of people just assume because you have stuff and because your parents have a little bit of money. And in some cases, your parents have a lot of bit of money that you don't have problems. Right. Right. Or that you're not burdened or that somehow, I I don't know. I just, I think I, I'm frustrated by the lack of representation of these kids. Right. It's not to say the kids who are marginalized in different ways because they don't have resources because there is community violence. Of course we should be concerned about those kids, but where's the space to really sort of hold space and, and think about, what the struggles are like for these other kids. Because I feel like in some ways the parents, and you correct me if I'm wrong, really do reflect that idea of there's a certain way to speak, there's a certain way to act. And if you just hold on to that, do you know what I mean? Like the other stuff will get better or the other stuff matters a little bit less. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, and I'm a parent, talk about from your perspective, Mm -hmm. what, you know, what were the, what would you say the parents attitude or, or perspective was on how Ashley needed to be navigating things. Cause I could tell Joe was like the, she's the one, you know, we don't really talk about Joe cause Joe went the wrong way. Like that's sort of the impression that I get. Maybe that's, maybe that's wrong. But what, what about parents? Like how were Ashley's parents without giving too much away? How did you envision them and their perspective on what their daughter was going through? Were they even aware of what she was dealing with? I think, so many parents of a certain age and and we all just sort of were raised with respectability politics right like parents of a certain age buy into respectability politics and it's not um it's not an indictment on them it's on a society that makes us feel like we have to um and they had to behave in a certain way to get certain places so I think with her parents, they, they're so mired in that way of thought mm-hmm. that they're not able to really see how it's hurting their daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think because for so long, like we haven't as a community spoken about our mental health, there's always been kind of like, we're Black, we're strong, we do this, suck it up, we can do it, um, get through it. And I kind of envisioned them as that where they they mean well her parents mean well always but don't recognize the ways in which they're harming their children by not allowing them the space to be hurting and the space to fail and the space to kind of um it's like they're they're overprotective and they're they're i guess they're kind of helicopter parenting to Mm -hmm. a certain extent Mm -hmm. um which i know is kind of more of like a millennial um thing but I think that that actually holds true for a lot of minority communities where if you have been black or brown in this country your parents want so much more for you because of what this country has traditionally meant um, for black and brown people Mm -hmm. and and sometimes in the process of wanting so much more for you they put these kind of pressures on you that are they're not sustainable long term for your mental health so that's kind of how I envision them. I envision them almost like the Cosby family, um, obviously without, without that. <laughs> right. Yeah, we know. We got it. <laughs> right. Without, without, without. So right. I, <laughs> I envision them as almost like that, but what does that actually look like? Not, yeah. um, 
not the sitcom version of it, not the Fresh Prince version of it. Like what right. does that look like when you actually have people who are removed from community and like Carlton is like the punching bag. He is the joke, but th- that is a real struggle that kid has yep. if you're looking at that from a serious lens. So that's right. Um, and with Ashley, I envisioned her as like a Carlton or like Lisa Turtle or like Dion mm. Lewis. So yes. These movie references are the black best friend. Um, all of them were factoring into my head in terms of thinking of like, okay, well, what, how are they moving through the world? Wow. When you said Lisa Turtle, I just thought, yep, because when, you know, when Saved by the Bell was out, it was sort of like, when you talk about respectability politics, I, I have a visceral reaction to those images because those were images where it was like, you didn't see black girls with braids in their hair, right? You're, you have beautiful braids. I have locks. We didn't see no black girls who look like that when we were, you know, I know we're different generationally, but when we were kids, that's not what we had. And I tell my daughter all the time, baby, all we had in my day was, I'm, I'm going to date myself, girl, Janet Jackson on um, different strokes, right? She was it. We had tie bridges. Right, I forget Gary Coleman, and then that one time they did an episode, and I'm gonna make everybody go Google it. When the sister Dana, I forget the the sister's name, painted herself in blackface to make a point, girl. Yes. Oh no. Yeah. Yes. Oh no. That's I'm what we I had. That. Yes, because she was making a point. The boy she was gonna go out with was racist, and everybody oh. knew it except for her. And so oh. they were going to the some prom. This sister comes downstairs, like, and this was like network television. That's what we had. And that was the point. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And so, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, we go from that to, like you said, um, Lisa on um, Saved by the Bell, mm-hmm. or I forget Deanna her name. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Dion and Clueless, or um, on The Fresh Prince, Hillary. Uh, Ashley or Hillary, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hillary. Mm-hmm. Ashley, I was okay with, because Ashley yeah. seems kind of normal to me. Yeah, but Hillary sure. was just on another, she was on another, and I knew <laughs> girls like that. But I think the idea is, in terms of that representation, and we, I don't, well, I'm a chocolate girl, so let me own that part, right? I mean, it's obvious. I didn't see girls who look like me. And so right. even when there were black girls, those black girls didn't look like me. And I yeah. think that there's nothing wrong with our sisters of all hues. Yeah. That's not my point. My point is just that that's not what's reflected in the mm-hmm. media. And I think that in and of itself, historically, has mm-hmm. a really detrimental impact on a lot of young women. So just this idea, that's, that's why I chose HBCU mm-hmm. because I wanted to be in a place where it was okay to have natural hair, where it was okay to be chocolate or any color of the rainbow. And, mm-hmm. you know, my point is that when I think about Ashley in my mind, she mm-hmm. looks like you, right? That's- Before I even saw your picture, I was like, oh yeah, that's Ashley. And so then when I, was, I was like, yeah, that's her, that's her. <laughs> and just the idea of I can conjure that image and, and everything in that book feels so true and so authentic and so much across time, I felt myself really hurting for Ashley just in all the little situations she was in, like one of the boys that she liked and it wasn't clear if he liked her back or not, you know, just like the, the isolation. And so I guess I wonder if you can talk a little bit about th- that, I, the, the mental health impacts, just, you know, just what you think in terms of what it's like to be isolated like that all the time. And you touched on it a little bit, but I'm just wondering, like, what's that, what might that isolation do to a kid in that kind of environment? I mean, I think it's super detrimental. And I think like going back to what you said about being, especially even a chocolate girl and moving through these situations, I grew up as a dark skinned person in, um, most situations and you're made to feel not beautiful you're made to feel uh i remember at one point a girl in i want to say fifth grade uh we got into an argument and her immediate response was oh well at least i'm not the color of shit so like that those are the things that you carry and that's in fifth grade like that that's girl that ain't that long ago i mean i know you're not like a baby but that's not like a hundred years ago oh my god (laughs) So oh my god it, yeah 90s so it just it these are the things that like you you deal with in those situations and that stuff follows you into as you're building relationships it follows you into your friendships like i mean i, I think there are just so many things that um that isolation can do to you in terms of your mental health i grew up feeling 
not attractive and, yeah. and was almost sort of surprised when I found out <laughs> that other people thought otherwise. Um, <laughs> because I grew up in, in places where I was definitely not the beauty standard. And so when I got to college and people were trying to date me, I was like, wait, what? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and even as an adult now, I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> But I, I think that like it, it impacts your sense of self. It impacts yeah. your self esteem. Um, I grew up feeling like I was one of the smart kids, so I had to like just focus on my academics and focus on doing super super great in school. And maybe I wasn't the looker. Maybe I wasn't the blonde haired blue eyed girl. But I could achieve, right? So like I think that was one motivating force throughout life. Was just like. I'll get the good grades. I'll do the honors courses. I'll do like the super special program. Um, and I, I think a lot of my self-worth was built on achievement and, and, and making sure that I was always uh, doing something to prove my worth, I guess, at least a little part to myself, but also to other people, right? Like it's that burden of representation. Like, look, I do it. And I, I know that you don't think I can do it, but I was constantly trying to prove to other people um, my value through achievement. And, and it's not that other people were even necessarily saying to me, you can't do it, but you right. just feel it, right? Like yep. you feel that in your bones, you feel that in terms of how people talk to you, you feel it when people are surprised that like you can do A, B, C, or D, right? Um, so I think that that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to explore is Ashley is also, she's a cheerleader, but she is a smart girl. Like this is the girl who's super stressed out about getting into Stanford. That's, right. um, that's like the, the, the stress of her existence in the book, that's which right. caused her to make some very horrible mistakes. Yes. Um, but it was also important to me that like, Ashley's not a clown. Ashley's not a goof. She's, she's, she's a thoughtful girl who yes. gets into some situation that she shouldn't be in because of her lack of self-awareness. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, I think that, that that aspect of mental health, just what does that look like when you were striving, 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 or yes. silencing, 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 like both yes. of those things at the same time in yep. Ashley. And I think it's part of what breaks Joe down ultimately. Um, but also what does that look like over generations, right? Because like, it's not just Ashley, it's her parents and her grandparents. And what does that mean when you've had generations of Black people trying to do better for themselves at the cost of their their mental health which i mean it, it, to a certain extent is all of us right like that's fine um when we are striving in that way and and sometimes when we're disconnected from our communities in that way just because of what higher education has looked like if you don't go to an hbcu that's fine. certain communities look like if you are not in like a wealthy black enclave that's right um, what does that do to be constantly pushing and pulling in in the wrong directions in some way if that makes sense absolutely 100 percent. i'm like clutching my chest because everything that you're saying just so deeply resonates with you know my own experience and thinking about this whole idea of you strive because that's the thing that you have control over yeah you don't have control over how people look at you, mm -hmm. but you totally have control over, I'm going to have a 4.0, do you know what I mean? Or a, over a 4.0. I'm going to have such good grades at Stanford or Harvard or any Ivy, because I have three degrees from PWIs too. So I, I mean, I have those, right? Yeah. So I was in those settings too. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell me I'm going to sit in the front of the class. Like, just think about what it does to us. I'm going to sit in the front of the classroom because I don't want anybody assuming that the black girl is lazy, yeah. right? Like you said, even if no one's ever said it, that's what you, I, my daughter, Ashley, that's what we carry with us everywhere we go. And I've had the same experience as you when people started saying, oh, you're so, you know, you're, you're a beautiful woman. I was like, who are they talking to? Right? Like, wait, wait, who, what? Who are y'all talking to? I, I don't know what you, I don't know what you're talking about. So just the idea of, I did the same thing, right? And for full disclosure, I could control my grades. Mm -hmm. I could control, you know, running for class president. I could, you know what I mean? At least I could make an effort and I ended up losing, but doesn't matter. <laughs> right? <laughs> you did it too. Right? But it's like, you I, part of me was like, I have to prove to myself that I'm strong enough to do this. I'm not going to allow these folks, right? Because my high school, I went to public school. My high school was like probably 80% 80, 80 white. 
Mm-hmm. And the rest of it was a little bit, um, it was a mixture of Filipino American kids. I know there's a large Filipino population out in California. There's a large one in the Virginia Beach area too because of the Navy. Um, so there was a large Filipino population and it was black folks. So it was black folks. I don't, and I tell people, I don't say black, Asian and white. It was black, yeah. Filipino and white. Yeah. There were not a lot of Latinx kids. And so it was sort of like, I even think for the Filipino kids, they were often having to choose and navigate. Yeah. Am I going to be with the white kids? Or am I yeah. going to be with the black kids? And I can distinctly remember one of my brother's best friends was a Filipino guy named Ron Sassad. He's awesome. He went to HBCU. Like that's how in it, yeah, that's how in it Ron was. He married a Filipina, right? And they, you know, beautiful children, but he went to Norfolk State University because I think there was just you know, that was the choice that he made, you know, and that's where he felt comfortable, I'm, I'm assuming. My, one of my best girlfriends is Filipina, and, you know, she didn't necessarily choose that route. She went to Berkeley and, you know, a couple other PWIs, and so she had a more multicultural, I think, experience. But even that was hard, trying yeah. to create a multicultural, and that's how I see Ashley, right? Mm-hmm. She's trying to create this sort of multicultural coalition, but even in that, you're always fighting and bumping your head up against the structure, and the structure is whiteness, yeah. right? It's, it's this white structure. And it's not to say that it's all bad. It is to say that that is the standard and we're all trying to figure out where do I fit against this standard. And so just like you said, sometimes the weight of it can be crushing for yeah. black folks. And we, when we don't acknowledge it, like you said, we just keep pushing through. Mm-hmm. I feel like that has really detrimental effects. So I'm going to diagnose Ashley. Forgive me. <laughs> I'm going to give Ashley a little preliminary diagnosis. And I'm I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. I would say Ashley's probably, I wonder if she's, I know she, I think, I assume she struggles a little bit with self-concept, right? Sort of like, where does she fit? Which is not a mental illness. But I wonder if there's some depression and anxiety in Ashley because of all she deals with. What what would you say that we're just speculating, but what would you, what would you say? I would say absolutely. And and I wrote that purposely because we don't see... uh, we don't see that in our, our characters and especially in our, our, our black characters, our, our middle class characters. Um, we see a lot of coming of age stories about depressive white kids, but we don't really see what that depression can look like in black kids. And uh, Ashley throughout the book is, is clearly depressed, clearly anxious and isn't, has no handle on it. She thinks of her sister as the one who has the issues but they're really kind of just dealing with it in very different ways, right? Like they're kind of just, um, they're flip sides of of the struggle in that way. And to me, it was important that her depression and her anxiety are partially why she acts as she does, like why she does what she does to LaShawn, why she does what she does with Michael, like all of these things are a factor into why she, she behaves in the way that she does. And then when we also find out about her grandmother and Mm -hmm. what happens there, um, I wanted to view it within the lens of how depression uh, can be both sort of genetic and how it's both in the genes, but also situational and also environmental, right? Like uh, Ashley is experiencing this without realizing that there's a a history, a family history there. Mm but also we see that there's like the intergenerational trauma that impacts all of them uh, in this low level way. Yes. Um, and, and her father deals with it very differently. Like he disconnects. Yes. yes. Um, and, and so it's, it was just important to me to show this very complicated black family dynamic that I don't think we get to see very often at all. Um, or if we do see it, it's kind of caricatured. So I just wanted to do something that was very honest with with anxiety and depression and and black families and a lot of times just our failures to communicate with each other because of all all the weight the societal weight right yes oh (laughs) everything about that every time you say something I'm like yeah second that second that echo (laughs) yes ditto times 100 right it's just the the foresight to in this moment in time be able to talk about, and I know a lot of planning went into this, right? It didn't happen, happenstance, it's not last minute. And you like were very thoughtful and did your research and your homework. And I just think that for this moment in time, for the book to come out, you know, 
right around this summer that we've had, right? Like just the, it was just so timely. And I think, you know, the quarantine has been both a blessing and a curse for so many different reasons. But one of the ways I think it may have been a blessing for a lot of black kids like Ashley yeah. is it keeps you out of being in school for many kids day to day having to deal with peers, particularly around the election and that kind of thing, and then police brutality and Black people, you don't necessarily have to have the sheer volume of conversations or hear the volume of ignorant comments mm -hmm. that you would have had to hear. So we're in the D.C. area. A lot of us, we've been on, um, nobody's, everything's virtual. Um, and so they don't have to physically go to school. And I just think for some of these Black kids and, and Brown kids, I know it's a struggle but emotionally it may have been a blessing because it's only so much of that vitriol you can get through electronically. Do you know what I mean? And Ashley's having to go to school day to day while the riots, while these guys got off and she's got to like try to navigate that in the backdrop on top of everything that you said is so layered. And so I'm just so grateful for you highlighting the mental health piece and bringing that forward and, and also having the insight and the foresight to communicate to people. I feel like the subtext was we got to deal with our stuff, right? But like parents, you have got to talk to these kids about what you're struggling with. We've got to like give these kids a break. We've got to be open and allow children to express themselves to us. You know, I feel like the older sister, there's a part of it where she didn't do everything right, but at least she's like trying to break free. Like her thing is, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. Now, maybe it's not always right, but at least she's trying. And I think what Ashley struggles with is really trying to fit everybody's image in some ways of who she's supposed to be. She's going to be the good kid. She's going to be the kid who gets it right. And that just can be so burdensome. So I think my, my last, so I wonder, do you have any thoughts about any of that? Let me just say that. Yeah, I think, well, I, I think being the good kid is, it, it, it puts a burden on both sisters, right? Like, I think it puts the burden on Ashley to have to constantly um, sort of mollify everybody. It puts the burden on Joe. Like, what does it mean to then be the bad sister? Um, it, it also, I think, with Ashley, like, when she doesn't get into Stanford, it's when she sort of breaks down and what does that mean when you've wrapped your whole self in achievement and then you don't achieve, what does that look like, right? Because I know that was something I definitely struggled with. If, if everything you think of yourself is wrapped around achievement, when you don't, um, when you don't hit that mark, when you don't get into whatever that school is, or if you don't get that good grade, or if you don't, um, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yes. if you get that job, it, yes. it breaks you down in a way that it wouldn't if you hadn't wrapped yourself in that achievement is almost like a, a, a comfort blanket. Um, and then in terms of 2020 and these conversations that people are having, I, I mean, even as an adult, they're very difficult to have. Like, I, I've done a lot of interviews about the book and I, I did them especially um, in the summer as things were really underway. And, and those are hard conversations to have. And they're especially hard to have with non-Black people. Mm. Um, I, 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 there are conversations where you feel like you have to tiptoe around what you're feeling or you have to, you have to be your most articulate self instead of just being like, I'm angry and I'm hurt and I'm furious and I, I wanna cry. Like, it, it, I've spoken to other writers about it, and sometimes when you write about these things, it can be very difficult to then have to go out into the world and talk about them yeah. for like months and months and months yes. of engagements. Um, and and sometimes when it's like this, it's healing, but other times it can break you down. And I think yes. that that's um, very much true of the conversations that Ashley is having to have, yes. but without. Uh, with a society that was even in some ways worse about these things back then. Yes, right? and definitely. Too, it, it's a whole different set of conversations that are happening. Um, and in 1992, it's very interesting looking at the press around the George Floyd protests and the press around the Rodney King um, riots or the LA riots. Initially, they tried to do the same playbook. Mm -hmm. Right, like initially they tried to do like the, oh, it's the rioting and the looting and not focusing on why are people angry. That's right. And I think in 2020, there was this shift where they realized that like, wait a minute, that we can't 
that angle isn't going to work right now. It's not going to work in 2020. It's not going to work with Black Lives Matter and with young people out there protesting. Right. And you got the cameras to prove that like, we're not the ones necessarily That's doing right. all these things. Like, That's uh, right. So they're really hard conversations to have. And, and I feel more for Ashley, if that's even possible mm-hmm. now than when I was even writing it. Cause mm-hmm. I'm coming at it from like, I've now experienced something similar as a slightly mm-hmm. more grown person. Mm-hmm. In 1992, I was only eight. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't fully understand what was going on around me at all. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like that poor girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, it's 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 a lot to deal with um and and especially when you don't have community in that way that's right and especially when you don't have and this is i'm not indicting parents when you Mm -hmm. don't have people in your home Mm -hmm. who have the level of awareness we're not going to call it ignorance but the level of awareness to be able to say let's sit down and have a conversation how are you feeling right it's all sort of don't go down there. You know what I mean? Like back then it was like, don't go down South Central because they're out there rioting and looting and I need you to be safe. And I feel like now for many of us, not all of us, but for many of us, there's more a sense of, okay, I don't want you out there because of COVID, but what can we do in the house? Can we like make sandwiches for people? You know what I mean? Or can we raise some money or, or is, you know, can you do something with social media to promote the message or can you get on a phone tree and help people organize or can you, you know, make masks? There's something in, and I think there's a little bit more awareness around that as well as just what you said because of social media in part, and because you have so many more people of color and black people who are out there as journalists, who are out there as reporters, you know, like street reporters and like, you know, formal journalists, it's harder to craft those messages in just one way because people will let you have it. Like, oh, we're going to do this? No, mm-hmm. we're not going to do this this time. Like, don't do that. Like, I remember the, all the arguments around um, and that powerful video. I think he played it on, it was one of the HBO shows, um, Sunday this week with uh, Oliver. I forget his first name. John Oliver. Was, yeah, yeah, John Oliver. And he had that powerful video of the sister in Minneapolis talking about Target, right? It was almost like spoken word. And she, he let it play for the whole six minutes. And when you watched her break it down, it was like, oh, yeah. So if I even thought I wanted to think negatively about what was happening, that changed my mind. And so as a result of that, now Target apparently in in that area worked with the community to rebuild the store. So one thing, the thing that always sticks out to me, and I always, I love this, is that because they have such a diverse ethnic community of Black people there, Mm -hmm. one of the things that people demanded was increasing the, the variability and volume of spices. Oh my you don't even, little stuff like that, right? You don't even think about it. So like they got a whole wall of ethnic hair care now, right? Carol's daughter and all that stuff. But they also have all these new spices that people used to cook with who come from like probably Somalia, you know what I mean? Eritrea, yeah. Ethiopia. But that's what happens when, you know, you listen to people and you bring people together and you try, you make an effort, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I just, I have to say everything about this book I love um, you know, I found in part, I, you know, I found you on social media. I was like, I'm going to go find her. And then my daughter, I was like, Morgan, 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 I found her, I found her. And I was like, you've got to tell her how you felt about this. I think she read it in like two days. She was like, mom, this is me. I am Ashley. Ashley is me. This is just, this is my life. Mom, how does she know my life? You know, teenage is so melodramatic. How does she know my life? And so, so I just want to say to you how deeply I appreciate you being, you know, putting your experience and in, in, in funneling, funneling it through Ashley for the rest of us to see a side of Black people that we almost never get to see. Now, we're going to put it in the universe. You don't need to tell me. My daughter and I have already decided this needs to be a movie. And when it's a movie, we've already cast Ashley. So we already know who Ashley needs oh, to be. Oh, I want to know who you guys have cast. We said Lexi Underwood, the, the oh, Pearl from God. Little Fires Everywhere. We yeah. said that's, that's, that's <laughs> Ashley. We need <laughs> Ashley. Um, but there's so many. Or I, she might be a little older. Um, she used to be on, I think, her, Ryan Destiny. Like, in my mind, she's oh, like... Destiny. Say again? I said, I don't know if I know Ryan Destiny. She was on Star. Remember, there's three main characters on that show, yeah, Star, yeah. the uh-huh. chocolate girl. Gorgeous, uh-huh. gorgeous, gorgeous. Like, she could be Ashley, right? But she might be a little too old. So we've I already cast it. We already I cast love- it. <laughs> happy. Ah, I love it. So it was, 
happy. Oh, of course. It's, so it was just a total pleasure to speak with you. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time. I can't say it enough. And I would just like to ask if you would tell people, you have any final words about the book or where they can go find the book, tell us the title and publisher one more time so everybody can go get it. Thank you so much for having me, by the way. Um, of course. I, this was a pleasure. Um, so the book is The Black Kids by me, Christina Hammonds Reed, and the publisher is Simon & Schuster, Books for Young Readers. Um, and you can find it in, preferably go to your local indie bookstore. But if, for those of you, it might be a little bit more difficult to, to do so. It's on Amazon, it's in Target, it's in... Costco, some Costco's. So it's all over the place. But if you can go through, I think it's IndieBound. No. Find your indie bookstore nearby <laughs> and, and 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 you'll you'll see. Or if you can find a black owned bookstore to support. And then most of them have copies in store too. I know I just signed a whole bunch for underground books in Sacramento. So I think if you reach out to them, yeah, they should have some. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, Christine Hammonds Reed, bless you and all your endeavors, whatever comes next. We are excited to see it. And I'm just so grateful to you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Yay, thank you. So there you have it. That's a wrap for another episode of Couched in Color. We want you to know that we deeply value you, all of our viewers and our listeners, and everyone out there working to support optimal mental health, both for themselves and for our young people. And one of the best ways you can help our movement is by leaving us a five-star review on our YouTube channel and everywhere you enjoy your audio podcasts, and by sharing our podcast with a friend. Please also tag us while you're out there listening and watching. Finally, head on over to dralfie.com for more information about me, www.acomaproject.org for information about my nonprofit. And those are the places you can go to learn more about how you can help. So I'll see you next week. And until then, I'm going to say what I always say, which is that I'm wishing you lots of love, lots of light, and that I'm hoping it is always, always informed by good culturally relevant science. Take care.